going to ask my wife Betty to pray for me again for the message, so speak into that. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together again to hear from you, Father. And Lord, I ask that you would bless your word as it goes forth, that you would open our hearts in anticipation to receive it, and, and that it would fulfill your will in our lives. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Amen. Thank you, dear. Hallelujah. Well, if you have your Bibles, let's uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, some very beautiful words from the prophet. Graham started this conference with us being mobilized as an army for spiritual warfare. And then Jane spoke about the commitment of this movement in the church to Israel. And then Harun spoke of sharing the gospel with the Muslim world and exposing the lies of Islam. And then I shared last night about God's glory in the international church, the glory of the church. And today I want to share and finish, this, finish the conference off with a message about establishing the kingdom of Yeshua on the earth. Establishing the kingdom of Yeshua upon the earth. You are the glorious bride of Yeshua. And at the end of this period of time, Yeshua's kingdom will be fully established on the earth. Let's read this beautiful section from the prophet Isaiah chapter 2, which is known around the world. In Christian circles, in Jewish circles, it's even quoted on the walls of the UN, only partially, however. Isaiah chapter 2, from verse 2 to 4, says, V'haya b'achrit ha'yamim nachon yehar bet Adonai b'rosh ha'arim v'nisa migvaot v'naru elav kol ha'goyim. And it says, and it will come to pass in the end of days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established at the head of all the mountains and will be lifted up above the hills and unto it all of the nations will flow. Malchu amim rabim v'amru lechu v'nale el har Adonai el bet Elohei Yaakov v'yorenu midrachav v'nilchav borchotav ki mitzion teitzei Torah u'dvar Adonai miyerushalayim it says, and peoples, many peoples will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, for he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion will go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And verse 4 is very high, beautiful level Hebrew, and I believe this is the part that's quoted at the UN, written on the walls, Vishafat. No, actually, just the second half of this verse. The Shafat ben Hagoim, the Hochiach la Amim Rabim, the Hitatu Harvotam, the Itim, the Hanitotehem la Mazmerot, the Lo Yisagoe el Goe Herev, the Lo Yilmadu o de Milchama. And it says, and he will judge between the nations and he will rebuke many peoples. That's the part I think they missed. But they did quote this. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And a nation will not lift up sword again to nation. And neither will they learn war anymore. Hallelujah. Well, we pray every day. I hope we do. The Lord's Prayer, which begins this way. Avinu sheba shamayim yitkadesh shimcha tavo malchutcha yaseh ritzoncha kva shamayim ken ba'aretz. Our Father in heaven, may your name be sanctified. May your kingdom come and may your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And I would simply like us today to believe that prayer. I want us to believe that our prayers can really bring the kingdom of God. 
and that we really will be done on this earth, this planet, this planet that our feet are walking on, it will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. That's where the fight is. There's no battle in heaven right now. The battle is for this planet. We are battling for God's will to be done upon this earth. We are battling for his kingdom to come. And I think a lot of people have lost their faith that that could happen. And so instead of believing that God's will could be done on this earth as it is in heaven, people say those words, but what they mean is, Lord, get me out of this earth and bring me up to heaven because I can't handle it anymore. Why are you laughing? That was a joke. So anyway, um, so what if we believed it? What if we believe that God's kingdom would come and his will would be done on this earth as it is in heaven? Let me mention that as far as I can understand from scriptures, God's kingdom come comes in two stages. Well, actually three stages. I want to deal with the two right now is our lifetime and the world immediately after this. The kingdom comes right now in God's power, his spirit, his life coming inside of us. The values and vision of the future kingdom of God are in our life right now and our lives are transformed that we can live our lives on this earth as God's will would be for us in heaven that's the stage we are in right now but that is not the stage doesn't end there it goes on to another stage and that stage is when Yeshua will return Jesus will come back and he will kick the devil off of this planet. He will bring peace upon the earth. And there will be prosperity. And the dead will be raised. And righteousness will dwell upon the earth. And I want us to believe not only for this stage, but for also the stage to come. We could look at the mission of Jesus in two halves. He came first of all to come to this planet as a lamb to die for our sins upon the cross and then to be and to rise from the dead to give us eternal life and to, to be lifted into heaven so that we could receive the spirit of God living inside of us hallelujah but there is a second half to his mission and that he will not come as a suffering servant, but as a conquering king. He will not come as a meek lamb, but he will come as a roaring lion. And when he comes the second time, it will not be to die for our sins, but it will be to judge the world of their sins and to establish his kingdom upon the earth. I wonder if you, some of you are hesitating at that. I like what Derek Prince once said that we stand right now between two mountaintops. Behind us is the mountain of the cross where Jesus came to die for our sins. But ahead of us is another destination. And that is the second coming of Yeshua to establish his kingdom upon the earth. And as every day goes on, we get closer to that day. And I want to help you today to simply believe that this can happen. Hallelujah, you, saw, you heard in Harun's heart, wasn't that encouraging, amazing, that we could believe together how meek is, how little is most of our faith. It was embarrassing, we could feel it. How big was his faith? And that, 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 that the Muslim world can receive the gospel by the hundreds of millions. And that the lies of Islam can be, can be exposed and, and collapse. But I want to impart to you my part of the faith which is I believe that Jesus will return and I believe that his kingdom will be set up upon the earth and he will rule and reign the earth and the earth from Jerusalem and there will be a period of a thousand years of peace and prosperity upon the earth I have that in my heart and I want to give it to you today hallelujah yeah, if you want it now Yeshua also said that there are two 
prerequisites for his coming. One in Matthew 24 and one in Matthew 23. In Matthew 24, he said, This gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all of the world, and then the end will come. And in Matthew 23, he turned to the Jews in Jerusalem, and he said, You will see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, I want to see Yeshua come back. I want to see his kingdom established on the earth. And I realize Yeshua has set in front of us two challenges. Pretty big challenges. That the gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all of the world and our people ooh, are going to receive him and welcome him to return. And we want to believe together for those two things. I actually believe they're connected. Because if the gospel goes around the world, people will begin to pray for Israel around the world and soften the hearts of our people so that we will receive him back as well. Hallelujah. And I want us to set our hearts today to accomplish these two goals. That we will see the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom preached in every single nation of the world, and we will see the people of Israel turn to Yeshua and cry out, Blessed is he who comes comes in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now when you look to most teachings about the end times and the coming of the kingdom of God in the next stage, I would say that there tends to be two different outlooks on that coming. The first one is what I would call a worldview of evacuation. And the second worldview is a world of repossession. I happen to believe that the worldview of repossession is the correct biblical viewpoint and that the worldview of evacuation, which may be believed by the majority of the charismatic world today, is the incorrect viewpoint. Now, I don't mean if you die today that you won't go to heaven. And I don't mean that there isn't a day when Yeshua returns and we are swept in the Lord to, into the air to meet him. But God's plan is not for us to evacuate this planet and live forever in heaven alone without the planet earth. God's plan is for Yeshua to return, as I said, for the devil to be kicked off, for the dead to be raised, for peace and prosperity to be established on this land with his government capital in Jerusalem, with Jesus ruling and reigning over this world as a king, hallelujah, and us living in peace and prosperity, hallelujah. And I want to increase your faith that this can happen. That I want us to receive him not only as a suffering servant, but a conquering king. Not only the mild and meek lamb, but also the roaring lion of the tribe of Judah. Now it's interesting, you see these two pictures of scriptures. In fact, as Jewish people read the Bible, they, they're, they're not sure. They say, we see one picture of the Messiah as a suffering servant, as it says in the book of Zire, Zechariah that he will come meek and mild, riding on a donkey. But then it says also in Daniel chapter 7 that he will come in power on the clouds of heaven. And we can't figure out, are there two options? Are there two Messiahs? Are there two different periods? And we have the answer in Yeshua that they are both true, and he will come first to suffer and then come to conquer, as it also happened with every single biblical hero in history. And we want to believe for this second part to happen. Now, when Yeshua returns, something, there will be a transition. Yeshua said to his disciples, he said, you must believe in me and I will die for you and rise from the dead 
so that you can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life and then you yourselves must take up your own cross every single day and come follow me and you must deny yourself to be able to do that but he said at the end I will return I will return in glory I will return in power I will return with the angels from heaven and I will conquer I will judge the nations and raise the dead and he said, when I do that, listen closely. He said, when I do that, those of you who have followed me, and he was only talking to the 12, he said, you 12, when I return, if you have followed me in this lifetime, you will sit on 12 thrones, ruling and reigning over Israel in the world to come. Did you get the principle? Very simple, two stages faithfulness in this lifetime leads to dominion in the in the world to come the degree to which you are faithful in this lifetime determines your position in the world to come Jesus told a parable and he said that those people are who are faithful even in a little bit we talked about some of the men here maybe just sweeping the floor in this conference well hallelujah if you're faithful with that and we'll get the same reward as uh, Queen Esther over here is going to get. Hallelujah. Uh, we just have to be faithful in a little bit. God doesn't need quantity. He needs the quality of your heart. Now listen. Jesus came on the first time not only to die for our sins. But also, listen carefully. This is hard to get. But to establish the basic core value of the kingdom of God, which is sacrificial love. He came to die on the cross to say, this is what my kingdom is about. It is love. It is total love. It is unconditional love. It is love where you are willing to sacrifice yourself for someone else. And this is the door to the kingdom of God. And it establishes the primary value of how life will be in the coming kingdom. So we are to now, in our lifetime, develop that value of the kingdom in our heart so that we can rule and reign with him when he comes back now listen we don't have to take dominion over the whole world before he comes back now because I believe in victory and I believe in the spirit of dominion and faith and the coming of the kingdom of God some people mistakenly think that I teach that we're going to take total dominion over the earth before he comes back that's not what I'm saying but Yeshua said, if you will learn to walk in righteousness, then when I come back, those who have righteousness in their heart, they will rule with me. God doesn't have a power, a problem of power. He has a problem of lack of righteousness in the human heart. And we have this period of time to develop righteousness, to develop sacrificial love, to develop the values of the kingdom of God so that when he comes, he can impose that kingdom on the whole world when he returns. Now that's a little bit of the difference between our worldview and I would dare say the political secular world on one hand and the Islamic world on the other hand and I have seen with uh, with Harun amazingly to see people that are hardcore terrorists have turned at one verse of scripture when they saw Yeshua teach love your enemies and they say, we've been taught our lives, kill your enemies. And you say, love your enemies. And that touches their heart. And that's the difference in our worldview of the kingdom. We have come to demonstrate to the world sacrificial love and the values of righteousness. But that love and that righteousness will take over the world because God is filled with love and he is filled with righteousness. Hallelujah. Now, it's very important, let me just mention something here it's very important for us to read the Bible I hope that's clear because we live in a day of smartphones and most of the young people have all the Bible on a smartphone and so you can pull it up and you can jump to a verse and pull it out and it'll flash up now that's nice if you're in the marketplace and you need to pull up a verse 
But you also have to read this book every single day in a consistent fashion from beginning to end. You need to know what the plan of God is. You need to be sure of it because Jesus said in the end times there will be a problem of deception and you've got to know what this word says and that does not come from pulling up a verse here and there on your smartphone. It comes from reading this book every single day in a consistent consistent manner that you know what is in this book from beginning to end. Yeah, I want to give you a few reasons for that. One I remember, uh, for those of you who know my testimony, I'm Jewish, brought up in a Jewish home, went to synagogue, was never in a, was never in a church in my life. I went to Harvard and I began to be plagued by the question, why are we here? What do we live? And uh, some people asked me what I majored in at Harvard. And I said, I primarily majored in sin at the time. <laughs> but I also read a lot of books when I was there. I read philosophy and psychology, fantasy books, science fiction, ancient literatures. I read everything I could find on Eastern religions. Everything I read except for one thing, of course, which was the Gospels. And when, one time, and I was traveling in Guatemala, Nicaragua, and someone challenged me to read the Gospels. And I said, oh, there couldn't be any truth in that. And they said to me, listen, you've read everything else. Why don't you just read this? I said, well, all right. Couldn't be anything in it. But I remember opening to the book of John as I began to read it, began to cry. And I just said, I read more truth in one minute then I read, then I read all the books on philosophy and psychology and Eastern religions and ancient literature and fantasy and science, everything that I ever studied. I said, this is what I'm looking for. But we need to know what is in this book. You need to be sure that you know it. So Jesus said in the end times, watch out that you are not deceived. Now, um, I believe we heard a prophecy recently and Jane mentioned it. It was a false prophecy. I believe it was a demonic prophecy and it came from the spiritual leader of Iran. After they signed this treaty with the nations of the Western world. And the spiritual leader of Iran said, we will wipe Israel off the map within 25 years. Well, this year is the year 2015. If I do a little arithmetic, 25 years is the year 2040. Here's something interesting for you. You know, in the Jewish world, we count years by letters, not by numbers. And it's interesting that if you keep counting, in a few years from now, we get to the end of the alphabet. In, in English terms, it would be as if we would get to the year Z, Z, Z. That year happens to be the end. It's actually in Hebrew, it's tough, tough. We get to that year in the year 2040. Now what I was thinking about that, I'm not saying that that's when Jesus is coming back. But I am saying that that little fact that I told you right now, sooner or later is going to leak out to the charismatic world. Oh, brother. <laughs> and it's going to leak out to the Jewish world. And what's going to happen is, I believe, as we, if we're still here by that time, as we get closer to there is going to be a flood of false messiahs in the Jewish world. There's going to be a flood of false prophets in the charismatic world. And we're going to get to that point when Islam is going to be declaring their kingdom coming out of Jerusalem. And we are going to be hit with massive uh, messianic deception over the world. Are you listening? And we've got to know what is in this book. The Apostle Paul said this, I am declaring to you now, he meant back then, I am declaring you now things that have, mysteries that have been hidden from mankind but are written in the scriptures. Uh, wait a minute, how could they be written in the scriptures and yet hidden? Because what he's saying, God has put his truth in this book and it's amazing. 
that there are things in this book that the world still does not understand. And each year as we get closer to the kingdom of God, God begins to reveal them to us. He is revealing things in this book that though they were written in them, were sealed and people did not understand them. There are things that Paul and Peter and John wrote about that they didn't understand. And we get to read what they wrote and they go, yes, I see it. And I believe they're looking down from heaven going, oh yeah, look at that. Paul said, I wrote that. And I'm saying things are being revealed to us now through the scriptures each day more and more. The fact that you read the Bible when you were a little kid in Sunday school does not mean that you understand the revelation of God about his kingdom right now. And even if you read it yesterday, we need to read the book every single day. The whole book, word for word, from beginning to end, and understand God's plan in this book. I just wanted to be clear because when I'm not teaching about something, something else. We're talking about the plan that's written in the Bible and is being revealed to us more and more as we walk in obedience to him. Amen. <clears throat> Now, as I said, there are these two worldviews in the Christian charismatic world. I say the Christian charismatic world as me being part of that. So I'm not talking about somebody else. In our worldview, there tends to be two options. As I said, the evacuation worldview or the repossession worldview. And I want to suggest to you today that repossession is the biblical worldview. Do you remember that, that God said to Joshua when he went into the promised land, he said to him, Kol makom asher tidroch kaf reg lechem bo, lechem nitativ. He said, every single place that the sole of your feet will tread, I will give it to you. Every single place. Now are you listening to me? This was given to our people a small people for a very small piece of property in the Middle East. But the promises are true to everyone who believes in Yeshua from every nation of the world. And so as we are to believe for our feet to tread on that piece of land, then you need to go back to your 170 nations around the world and start walking and praying and saying, the land that I tread on right now does not belong to the devil. It does not belong to the Antichrist. It does not belong to the secular world economic system. It does not belong to Islam or Eastern religions. It belongs to the God of the universe who created this piece of property in the first place I just happen to believe the first verse of the Bible which says Bereshit bara Elohim et aretz, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth I don't want to just go to heaven I want to go to heaven but I don't want to just go to heaven and relinquish this half of the creation that we want both heaven and earth together the Bible starts with God creating heaven and earth and ends up with God bringing heaven and earth back together. You can have both. Now I know, I'm being a little sarcastic just to make you think, don't get mad at me, or get mad at me, that's all right. You, I know just what you want is your pie in the sky. But you can have your pie in the sky, but we can also take dominion over this earth at the same time. Now, I don't want to go into this whole, the whole view of this, but just in a, in a nutshell, I believe that when God made the heavens and the earth, he made the heavens for angels, and he made the earth for the sons of man. And the Bible says in Psalm 115 that he gave the earth into the hands of mankind. He gave it to us on a long-term lease rental for 6,000 years to check our hearts what we would do with this. And he says, when you get done with this time, I'm going to come back. I'm going to hold you accountable for what you have done in your life. But then we are going to take possession back. He has given us this place on a long-term lease, but it still belongs belongs to him now we did something stupid which was that we sinned and submitted to the devil and the devil gave up him and he did something even more stupid he gave up his place in heaven as one of the top angels 
and he sinned. He was good when God made him. And he sinned and he came down to this earth and he usurped authority over this earth that was given to Adam. It was never given to the devil. And Jesus had to be born into this earth as a son of Adam to take the rights to this planet back on this, on this earth that God had originally given to Adam. Hallelujah. And that's why he said, I do what I do as it says in many of your translations, the son of man. But I would prefer to see that translated as the son of Adam. Now, so we are here to take repossession of this earth. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that God's plan is a mystery and it is revealed to us stage by stage. Listen, we have to read the book. It says very simply, he says in Revelation 10, I will tell you what the last mystery is. The last stage of revelation of the plan of God. He says it will happen at the seventh trumpet. And it, when the seventh trumpet blows, it says in Revelation eleven fifteen, he said this is the last stage of the plan of God that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Messiah and he will rule over this earth forever and ever. Amen. I don't know what could be clearer about that trying to figure out how to make this simple. I don't know if any of you, I realize the young people never saw this movie. I saw a movie when I was a child. It was called Space Odyssey 2000. Or 2001, I don't remember what it is. Did anybody here see that movie? Some of you, oh, you're an old crowd. Okay, well, the young people, you don't know what that is. The young people, I'll just tell you, there was kind of a science fiction movie uh, back in, uh, close to the year 2000, in which uh, the idea was there were aliens that would came and planted on this earth a black box, and it changed uh, human, uh, it changed apes into human beings, and then he came again, and he changed human beings into star babies that would float around in the universe. Hallelujah! That's not what I believe in. That's new age thinking. But unfortunately, that's how I think most Christians see the end times plan. That you're going to get evacuated out of here and become a star baby. Floating around in the sky somewhere. I don't believe that. I believe it's new age thinking. I believe it's false mysticism. It needs to be driven out of your thoughts. I mean, you almost don't have to read the Bible. You just have to watch the third movie of the Lord of the Rings where it says the return of the king and he comes back and takes possession over the earth and the earth is transformed into a beautiful place. Listen, that's pretty close to how I see it. What I want to say is we want to believe in repossessing the earth, not evacuating it. We get heaven and earth. God is, the, God is the God of heaven and of the earth. And he's coming back to take possession of what, he, what, longs, what belongs to him. And this is what scares the devil. Because he knows as long as God stays in heaven, he's the God of this world. Do you know that the, the New Testament says six times that the devil is the God of this world, meaning temporarily the God of this planet, having usurped authority from Satan until Jesus comes back to repossess it and kick him off the planet. But he is, and as long as Jesus stays in heaven, are you listening to me? That the devil remains the God of this world. Now, I want to challenge how you see the end times. Because if you see the end times, that Jesus comes halfway down out of heaven, stops, hovers around, and then goes back up, you are believing something of the devil, because if you believe that, the devil will remain the God of this world forever. Was that clear? In fact, if you believe that Jesus will come almost all the way down, one meter off the ground, you're not believing the right thing. Jane, do you remember the last time that we were together in Israel and we stood on the east side of Jerusalem? And I said, look at these two mountains. We stood with the, with the Mount of Olives on one side and the Mount of Zion, Jerusalem on the other side. It's not very far. You stand in the middle and it's about one mile on one side and one mile on the other side, maximum. 
And I said, here's the question. It's written in the Bible. Let's look at that mountain right there, the Mount of Olives. It says right there in Zechariah chapter 14 that Yeshua will descend from heaven in power in the middle of a war in which all of the nations will attack Israel and his feet will stand on that mountain again. And I said, do we believe that's going to happen? And I realized that his feet standing on that mountain is the fulfillment of what God said to Joshua, that every place where the sole of your feet will tread will be given unto you. And I believe that he will come back and he will stand with his feet touching on the Mount of Olives. And when he does that, he is repossessing planet Earth. And when he does that, at that moment, when his feet touch the ground, the dead will be raised because the power that is in him will go out through him into the Earth. It will raise the dead and the same power will grab the devil and the demons and throw them off of this planet. And then I said, do we believe that after that, he's just going to go over there one, just a couple of kilometers, cross over from the Mount of Olives and go into Jerusalem and set up his kingdom over there. That's what we just read in the book of Isaiah. We have a plan for world peace. Do you know that the idea of imagine world peace? That didn't start with the New Age, folks. That started with the prophet Isaiah. In fact, you can't get that vision anywhere. I challenge you to find a vision for world peace anywhere. It doesn't start with that verse of Scripture right there, Isaiah chapter 2. The vision of world peace is from God. It's from Isaiah. It's for Jesus, the Messiah, to rule and reign in Jerusalem. We believe in world peace. That's not leftist, that's the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. But what happened right after the war, where all the nations attacked Jerusalem, Mount of Olives happens just a couple of days before his entry into Jerusalem again. Now, I want us to believe this. You know, sometimes I wonder, sometimes it seems like the Muslims understand this more than we do. You know, if you look in the Middle East, Look at all these terrorist groups. I'm sure you've thought of this, Harun, that uh, if you look at Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab and you look at Hamas and Hezbollah and ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, if you look at them, they're basically, if you position them, they just make a loop, a circle right around Jerusalem, right around Israel with Jerusalem in the middle. And that's what these sheiks are saying, the mufti of Jerusalem and the, and the spiritual leader of Iran. They're saying, we're coming after you. We're coming and we're going to kill all the Jews. We're going to wipe Israel off the map. And we are going to take over an Islamic kingdom of death and revenge and hatred starting from Jerusalem. Now you say, wait a minute. I thought Mecca was the capital of the Islamic Kingdom. And it's amazing that the word Jerusalem is not even mentioned in the Quran even one time. And if you see uh, the Muslims praying in Jerusalem, they turn their back to the Temple Mount, turn their rear ends, their back, the underside of their feet, which is a sign of disrespect in Islam, and face toward Mecca. So what's the interest in Jerusalem? Huh? Listen. We need to understand what's happening. Radical Islam has changed over the past few years. Not, not, not the original plan. The original plan is the same thing. But you see, Muhammad was in the area of Mecca and Medina. But they, when they look to the future, they look at a future Khalifa. They look at a future uh, a coming of a world leader called the Mahdi. And he will rule not from Mecca, but from Jerusalem. For them, Mecca is behind them. They are looking to capture Jerusalem. They're looking to stop the plan of God. And this is the battle is not over Mecca. It's not over Washington, D.C. It's not over New York. It's not over Brussels. It's not over Seoul, Korea. The battle of the ages is over Jerusalem because that is where God said, I will set up my kingdom. Now it amazes me if there is any word that seems to have the whole world upset. It's the word occupation. The Jews have occupied Jerusalem. 
The Jews have occupied this land in the Middle East. And we said from the Israeli government, we said, how can we occupy our own land? It's our land. You're right, this land was conquered, it was occupied. 3,000 years ago at the time of Joshua when he went in and conquered the land. If you had a problem, talk to Joshua. What do you mean occupied? You see, here's the question. Are we here to evacuate or to occupy? Because where do you get authority as Christians in every nation of the world to take possession of the earth in your nation? Are you going to abandon your nation? Are you going to evacuate your nation? No, what happens is the promises of God to the Jewish people for the land of Israel are transferred to every nation of the world through faith in Jesus. And you can believe for your nation to be occupied, for the dead to be raised in your nation, for the Garden of Eden to touch your nation, and for peace to come upon the earth. We want to believe that together. Now we want to ask if we're believing for his kingdom to come and his will be done, do we believe that? If we do believe it, what will it look like? Well, I just told you what it would look like. Folks, why do believers, Bible believers, have confusion on this issue? Do you have a little fog when you try to understand what it will be like when Jesus comes back? Why? It's written time after time after time after time after time after time again and again in the scriptures. And I want to pray for you lovingly. I want to rebuke that fog of confusion and deception out of your minds about what's going to happen. Jesus is going to come back and take repossession of this planet and set up a kingdom of peace and prosperity with his kingdom in Jerusalem, the dead being raised and the devil and the demons kicked off the planet. I want that to be clear to you. Are you getting it? And I don't say that for me. I'm almost done and then we're going to pray. I'm saying this and I want you to hear this part of my heart because I love Jesus. I love Yeshua. He came. He saved me. He gave me eternal life. He gave me a destiny. And I want to see him fulfill his destiny. And you know what his destiny is? His destiny is to be a king. He stopped on the way to save you and me. But he has a destiny, which is to be a king, to rule and reign over heaven and earth, heavenly Jerusalem and earthly Jerusalem. He already reigns in heavenly Jerusalem, but he's going to unite the two and reign in heavenly Jerusalem and earthly Jerusalem at the same time. And I want to see him get to that. I am compelled with this. I am compelled for only for one person's sake. I don't see anyone else but him. And this is his destiny. And I say to you, Yeshua, I will not stop. And we will not stop. We are determined. We have faith. We have the substance of faith of the things hoped for. That we will see you return. We will see your kingdom established on the earth. We will see your feet touch down on the, on the Mount of Olives. And I don't mean to be this disrespectful but I want to prophesy you about another part of Yeshua's body this part right here I'm telling you folks we don't stop praying until his rear end hits that throne of glory in Jerusalem I tell you what hallelujah When that happens, I'm ready to take a break. Hallelujah. Until then, we need to be able to fight. I want to give you one last example from, um, from David Ben-Gurion, and then we'll pray. Uh, do you know David Ben-Gurion? He was the founder of the state of Israel. There was something interesting that happened to him. He actually started out 
His parents were religious Jews and he became secular, he became a socialist. He became a communist in Europe and like many of the European communist Jews, they became disillusioned with socialism in Europe because they saw anti-Semitism. And he began to read the Bible. Did you know that David Ben-Gurion wrote uh, um, Parshanut, how do you say that? Uh, Bible commentary. I read his Bible commentary. Fascinating. He read the prophets of Israel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. He read all these prophets and he combined it with a communist worldview. And so he, his vision was half communist or social, uh, let's say socialist, half socialist uh, dialectics with the vision of the prophets, but even getting it half right. He was able to go and be the founder of the state of Israel. I want you to know that he had faith to found the state of Israel because he read the prophets of the Bible. Now he missed it because he didn't combine it. If he had combined that with the Gospels, he would have had it right on down. But we want to read the whole Bible and we want to understand what it has to say. Well, if he could read the prophets of Israel mistakenly through socialist dialectic, why can't we read it with an eye from the Gospels of Jesus Christ and let's understand his kingdom. When he came, the years before he had a vision that Israel would become a state, and he began to work in Israel decades before that, and here's what he said, because we don't have a state right now, listen closely, this is profound, he said we need to build an organization that would have the ability to govern when we ever do get a state. He called that organization the Histadrut, which, which was a labor organization. And he began to build a, uh, an organization that ran the nation of Israel in the Jewish community while it was still under the British mandate. And they set up all the organizing committees that could run the entire society. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to the parable I'm trying to get across to you? And said, and when it came, when the British, when, when the end of World War II came and the British left, it came in a moment. The vote came from the UN and there they had it. They had to form a state immediately. Are you listening? They didn't have time to figure out what to do. They had to figure out how to rule before that happened. I'm talking to you. And so if we are going to rule and reign in the world to come, we need to be organized internally with values of righteousness, with understanding submission of authority, with sacrificial love. We need to know how to be a community together of integrity, of faithfulness. We, know how, we need to be know how to rule and reign with him so that when he comes in a moment, he can say, you were faithful and little. Come, rule over ten cities. And see, he built that ahead of time knowing it. And do you know that the word ecclesia for church in the ancient Greek and Roman world meant parliament? It meant the governing coalition. Before you can have a government, you have to build a governing coalition that you know what you will do when you get to be the government. Are you listening? You can't just get elected into a government and not know what you're going to do. You have to have a platform. You have to have values. You have to have an internal structure. You have to have leadership. You have to have a coalition. You have to understand the government that you want to bring. Because when the moment comes, it happens instantly. Are you getting that? There's two more minutes. We're almost done. But listen, you, you, uh, what God wants to build in us as the community of faith, as the ecclesia, he wants to build the values of his kingdom now inside of us so that when he comes back, there will be an instant change. And what happens when the values of righteousness are inside of us, they will become the kingdom government the moment he comes back. And here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to have when he comes back to say, oh, I'd like to rule and reign with you. Can I go through a training process? And he'll say, what did you do with your whole life? I don't know. I was watching TV waiting to get raptured.
Most people that I know believe that the gospel is get saved, get blessed, get raptured. That's not it, folks. Jesus has a plan to take the kingdom of God. Well, I didn't hear many people clapping that because that's what a lot of you believe. But I want to impart to you in faith that we have a plan of salvation at the first coming of Jesus. And we have a plan for the kingdom of God with Jesus establishing his kingdom upon the earth when he returns. And I want you to be part of it. I'm not rebuking you. I want to enlist you. Are you getting it? The last point. Here's the last thing of David Ben-Gurion. After he established his biblical commentary to reestablish the nation of Israel as a socialist Zionist, half biblical, half socialist state, and after he built an internal governing organization in the Histadrut, he got to about two years before the establishment of the state of Israel. And he looked at this, I've read this in his biography, it's amazing. He said that he looked and all of a sudden he realized, wow, I've been, I've been teaching for decades that one day we should have a state. And all of a sudden he realized, it's going to happen. And he turned to all his people and, and he, was, he was a scholar. He was not a military man, he was a scholar, he was a philosopher. He was a Bible commentary, a socialist. And he said, I looked, I said, all of a sudden I realized what's going to happen. The British are going to leave, we're going to get, and we're going to set up a state, it's happening. And he said, this is, all of a sudden I understood something. He said, the moment we get permission to establish the state of Israel, all of the countries that surround us are going to attack us the next morning. Are you listening? And he said, we're not ready. And he called all of the leaders of what was the, of the Histadrut together. And he said, listen, you take, I'm going to quit that. I'm going to do one thing only. And they called it the Ben-Gurion Seminar. Have any of you ever heard of this? And he said, wait a minute. He said, bring me the best military people around the world. He said, sit down. He said, I know nothing. I've never even seen a gun. Tell me what it's all about. And he said, I need to learn. I need to learn every single thing because before, right before we get to establish the, the state of Israel, there is going to be a massive war when all of the nations of the world will attack us and we are not ready. Are you getting the parable? And he says, tell me what I need to do. Let's buy weapons. Let's learn. Let's set up. Let's do something. Let's get ready because we're about to go into a period of massive warfare and we are not ready. Folks, we need to be ready. And when I say those things about the rapture, I don't mean to be mean. I believe in the rapture, but it just comes at the end of the tribulation, not the beginning, folks. And the only people could think that it would come in the beginning because you have been so blinded by comfort that you think God wouldn't want you to be uncomfortable, so of course you wouldn't be here. Take me to my sofa in heaven so I can watch it on closed circuit TV. I'm being sarcastic with you on purpose because I want to tell you something, folks. We are heading into massive spiritual warfare that this world has never known. Jesus said it will be the greatest time of trial and tribulation that the world has ever known. And he said in the Gospel of Matthew, after the tribulation of those days, and he said in the Gospel of Mark, after the tribulation of those days, how clear do you have to get? Amen. And he said, we will go through this and we will win. Folks, I don't want to miss it. I've joked about this before. I just want to get my heart. I said, if I'm wrong and the rapture is before the tribulation, I'm not going. <laughs> because it's not just a time of tribulation. Time of suffering is when you learn glory. It will be the time of greatest... It will be the time when we will see hundreds of millions of Muslims come to the Lord. It will be the time when we will see the great revival in Israel. It will be the time when we will see the second Pentecost. As Peter said, quoting Joel, in the end days I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. It will be time that the church will be unified, purified, glorified. And you don't want to be here for that? Come on. Cut that. Ev okay, that's enough. Let's stand up. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, here's what I want to pray for you. 
We are praying to establish the kingdom of Yeshua on the earth. I want this to be so clear to you. I want you to have the substance of faith of what we are hoping for. I want it to be substance in your heart. No doubt. I want it to be firm. I want it to be thick. I want it to be solid. I want us to know what it will look like. We're praying your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. I want it to be clear what will it look like when it gets here. How are we going to get there? What will it take to get there? And I am determined in my heart. I am locked onto this. I don't know how to explain this to you. Maybe you can feel it. But everything that happens to me every day goes through this filter in my mind. Is this going to move us closer to that day of Yeshua establishing his, his kingdom on the earth? Or if it's not. If it's not, I don't want it. If it's moving us forward. And I want to impart to you that determination, that substance. And I want us to covenant together that we together will bring this to pass because it has to be both the gospel of the kingdom preached to the nations of the world and the people of Israel saying blessed is who comes in the name of the Lord. And so I want to enlist you that we could be partners together with this. I am very serious about this. I'm not here to talk to you about theology today. I want to enlist you to be partners, that we could be partners together, that we will not flinch until we see Yeshua's kingdom be established upon this earth. You know, our people missed the first coming of Yeshua, by and large, not all of them because they were expecting his kingdom to be on earth. And Yeshua came, was crucified, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. And I don't want the church to miss the second part, that he's going to come back and establish his kingdom upon the earth. Well, I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you to impart the substance of this vision into you. I want us to partner in covenant together for you and enlist you to be part of that. May I pray for you for that? If you'd like to do that, can you just come forward with me and then we'll pray together for that. us to see this as a strategic moment. I'm not looking for this to be a feel-good moment. I mean, I hope you feel it, but I believe God will confirm it with revelation and anointing and power in your hearts. But I want, to, I want you to feel a determination to take this all the way to the end. I don't know how to explain this, but I feel like the Messianic community in Israel 2,000 years ago had a faith and determination to launch the kingdom of God out into the nations. And I believe he's reestablished that community there. And I'm not the only one. There's lots of people there, lots of leaders, lots of communities of faith. For us to bring it home, to finish the race, to bring it back to Jerusalem. And we can't do it without the Chinese Christians. We can't do it without a glow. We can't do it without the gospel to the Muslim world. But it's going to come home. And Jesus is going to come back. Hallelujah. 
You ready? And so what I want to say is I want you to be, I want to enlist you with a determination. I want a practical goal. I don't want this to tickle your ears. I want us to work together and not let go until we see Yeshua seated on the throne of glory and the devil kicked off this planet. I remember over 30 years ago when I got the revelation about casting out demons. Amen. I don't want to cast out demons anymore. I want to cast Satan off this planet. I want to get the whole bunch of them out of here. So that's enough. Let's pray. Hallelujah. You can keep going. Father, we pray right now for a vision of the kingdom of God. I pray for the eyes of our hearts to be opened. Now, there would be a spirit of wisdom and revelation as we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when our hearts ask, what will they look like? It will be crystal clear on the inside that we will see what Isaiah saw, what Jeremiah saw, what Ezekiel saw, what Peter saw and Paul saw and John saw. It'll be crystal clear to us. And Father, I pray that that vision of hope for the coming of the kingdom of God, peace and prosperity upon the earth, the dead raised, the devil kicked out, and Jesus ruling and reigning over the earth from Jerusalem will be so crystal clear with no doubt that it won't just be a vision. It won't just be hope. But I pray right now for a miracle for it to be crystallized into the substance of faith in your heart. And Father, we pray for a miracle right now. The substance of faith for the coming of the kingdom of God to be cemented in our hearts right now. Like a rock, like a stone. A foundation stone in our hearts of the kingdom of God. And Father, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit the fire of Pentecost to come upon us as it did upon the early church to start the race. Lord, we want a double portion to finish the race. Father, we pray for a determination to go the distance. Not balk seven years before the end, not three and a half years before the end, not ten days before the end, not ten minutes before the end, but to see Jesus return. That we will not relinquish our faith until the soles of his feet hit the Mount of Olives, until he crosses over and sits on the throne of his government in Jerusalem. Jesus, we are coming right now. We are drafting ourselves. We are enlisting in your kingdom army to see it pass. Lord, I pray for a gift of determination. Lord, I pray, Jesus, you may be the line of the tribe of Judah, but we're going to be bulldogs, hallelujah, to lay hold of you and not let it stop until you come back. And Lord, I want to see it. Lord, I want to thank you for being that suffering servant. I want to thank you for having your blood poured out for me. But I don't want to stop there. I 
want to see you in power. I want to see you in authority. I want to see you ruling and reigning for what you were born for. I want to see you fulfill your destiny. I want to see the world amazed at your authority, your goodness, your power. I want to see I want to see angels worshiping. I want to see devils trembling in fear. I want to see the nations submit to you. I want to see Jesus ruling and reigning upon earth and in heaven. In heavenly Jerusalem and earthly Jerusalem. Jesus, it's only for love of you. And Father, we covenant together right now into a partnership to serve in faithfulness, humility, prayer, spiritual warfare, love, sacrifice, faith, victory, dominion and power and authority in the name of Jesus until we see his kingdom come to pass. I just feel the Lord saying right now, when you see this ultimate victory, when you see the end, you know where you're going and you start running toward it and nothing will make you afraid because you know where you're going. You knowing how to get there. Your faith, I can just feel your faith right now latching onto it. And you say, nothing will make me afraid. I know where I'm going. Hallelujah. Father, we ask you right now. That just to confirm your word in our hearts right now. That your Holy Spirit confirm if this is what you are speaking to your church, to your ecclesia in these end times. Lord, grant us the grace and the power to see your truth fulfilled. Lord, wake us up from every deception. Shake us out of every compromise, Lord. I just want to pray again. We said that before. I want to pray it right now. In the name of Yeshua, every confusion, every fog, every deception, every misunderstanding about the coming of the kingdom of Jesus, I rebuke that out of you. In the name of Yeshua, I pray for clarity of thought. I pray for the word of God. I pray for faith and hope in what is clearly written in the word of God. I, I rebuke confusion and fog and deception. And I pray for clarity of vision and hope and faith by the word of God and the kingdom of Yeshua established in your heart in this day. Hallelujah. I feel like I have one last prayer for us. And then Jane, I'll turn it back to you. But We talked about relationship between men and women. And uh, how that we are all together the bride of Christ. But in that model... We are to be Yeshua's wife, his bride, his princess. But you know what? I think we as a princess need to be excited about our husband coming back and ruling and reigning over the world. Hallelujah. I don't want just intimacy with a loser. Are you understanding what I'm saying? A wife wants to be proud of her husband. She wants to see her husband fulfill his destiny and take up his authority. And Jesus, that's who we are for you. We, including me, we're part of your bride. And we want to see you in all of your authority, your glory, your power, your destiny. Come on. We want to see you roar as a lion from Zion. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.